Hello. I want to revisit the video that I did about a month ago talking about the Tun Year approach. Uh, because since then, Vera has put out their own proposal for the Tun Year approach, and uh, people have gotten a lot more interested in the subject. And, you know, looking back, the video that I did really only talked about one method of the Tun Year approach called the Lash Off method. It didn't touch on these other methods that are being proposed out there, and it didn't really touch on the method that Vera is proposing. So, let's recap real quickly why we want the Tanya approach, what it is, uh, and what it does. So, the Tanya approach is this way of basically computing the value add of preserving a forest for some duration of time over 100 years. So, for example, if we are preserving a forest for 10 years, we can say then what the 100-year benefit of, that, of preserving that forest is. This is really important for a couple of key reasons. First, there's no standardization out there for, for these carbon credits. So we've got carbon credits coming from projects that are 20 years and carbon credits coming from projects that are 100 years. And, you know, which ones are better? The carbon credits from 100 years are better. <laughs> but if we put them all on the same playing field, if we, if we level them out by, by having their credits equal to a 100-year standard, then that's going to make a lot of sense and it's going to make it easier to compare these carbon credits. Also, you know, these short duration projects right now, they're kind of being issued with all of the carbon. So the, the assumption of a 30 year project right now is that the carbon that's being issued to that project, it represents 100 years. So they're getting issued like basically everything that the trees are growing. That's a flawed assumption because what happens if that project ends in 31 years from now, somebody goes and cuts down all those trees. The ton year approach only issues credits for the period of time that the project lasts. And so that's really valuable because we're talking about, you know, Vera projects these days that have less than 10 years left on them. And who knows what's going to happen to these trees? Are we going to pay twice to preserve them? That's not a good idea. So that's, that's the first major reason. The second major reason that we need this approach is that we need to shorten the duration of carbon projects. Carbon projects right now, nobody wants to sign up for, for preserving their forest for 100 years. Nobody wants to sign that contract. And, and as a result, there's this big supply shortage. And, you know, what it's done is it's made it so that the only people who are signing these contracts are basically people who were preserving the forest anyway. So like the Nature Conservancy. So by having these super long duration projects, we've actually harmed the whole carbon industry. We've, we've made carbon credits worth less because the additionality is bad. So we need to shorten the duration of these projects in order to actually get people who would have harvested the timber in the first place to enroll. So that's, that's why we need this, this method. Standardization, improved quality of credits, all that. But a lot of the debate around this method comes down to basically the discount rate, which is basically saying, you know, what is the ratio between protecting forests for one year how much does that actually, you know, how much forest do we actually have to protect in order to have a hundred year impact? And so this is where these different methodologies come in. So let me start by talking about the underlying assumption of a hundred years. Even that we, not everybody agrees on. And there's good reason for that because a hundred years is kind of arbitrary. Do we want to actually have a hundred year long credit? You know, one assumption behind a hundred year credit is that you know, humans will have figured out green energy a hundred years from now, and we won't necessarily have to worry about climate change so much. A lot of our society's goals are based around a hundred years. So, you know, like two degrees C in the next hundred years, that, that kind of thing. So there is rationale behind using a hundred years. But what that means is that as opposed to using a number like 50 years, we can't issue as many credits. So if I want to, you know, protect a bunch of land for a, for a 10 year period and, and know the 100 year outcome, that's going to result in the issuance of fewer credits than if I were protecting that land and, and trying to figure out the 50 year outcome. And so some people in the field are actually arguing that maybe we shouldn't be using 100 years to the standard. Maybe we should be using a shorter duration. But it's dangerous territory because if we use shorter and shorter durations of, uh, you know, of length for our our, our standard, our equivalency, then that means that we're just kind of flooding the market with more and more credits. We don't want a, you know, a polluter like BP buying these offsets and claiming that, you know, they've dealt with their pollution. If these offsets only represent 50 or 30 years worth of pollution, then, you know, we're, we're still in a, in a mess 
50 or 30 years from now. So I support the 100-year standard, but I want you guys to know out there that there is this debate about whether or not we should have shorter duration 10-year credits so that we can increase supply and encourage more people to preserve their forests for, for these short durations. Um, assuming that we stay out, settle on the length, the next big question is, how do we figure out what the deduction rate is? Now, the approach that I talked about in that, in that other video was this very scientific approach that relies on looking at how much carbon has decayed out of the atmosphere uh, over a course of 100 years and using those, those, those curvatures, those lines, to figure out a ratio. Uh, and that ratio, you know, it comes out to like 40 or 50 if you use that approach. That was the lash off approach. But you don't necessarily have to use that ratio or that set of assumptions. You can just come up with a number, right? And so what Climate Action Reserve and Vera have done is they've just said, all right, we would pref if we're talking about a taking a 100-year project and making it one year, then that means that we just divide by 100. Therefore, you know, for every 100 tons of CO2 that you preserve for one year, you get one credit. I mean, there is some cold down-to-earth logic in doing that. It doesn't necessarily have this, this body of literature that you can cite with this rationale that, you know, uses the decay rate of carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, but, you know, if you are just looking to take a 100-year project and make it one year, it kind of makes sense to just divide by 100. There are other people proposing other ratios out there. So NCX proposes that uh, the ratio should be closer to 1 to 30 because... You know, they looked at the lash off method and then they said it's more valuable to preserve carbon today than it is in the future. Therefore, we should, you know, have this additional discount rate. So there's this big question. You know, what is the ratio? 1 to 30, 1 to 100, 1 to 128 I've even seen proposed. You know, this is the fundamental question and it has a big impact on how many credits are being issued, obviously. Because if you have to preserve 30 tons of CO2 for a year to get a credit, versus 100 tons of CO2 for, to get a credit, that's a big difference in the amount of credits that are being issued. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have a preference. I would, I would err with the most conservative side of things, which would be either 100 or maybe even 128. So in that sense, I think that Carr and Vera are, being, are playing it fairly safe. It would be nice to have a method out there for us to revisit this if more peer-reviewed literature came out. This is especially possible because we're now talking about really short duration projects. So we can just say, all right, next time around, instead of getting, you know, 30 tons of CO2, you're getting 35 or you're getting 25. Um, you know, uh, so so this is this is the rationale behind the approach. I'm again, I'm completely in favor of the approach. I think it solves a lot of problems in the industry right now. We just kind of have to figure out what the ratio is and what the rationale behind that is. And uh, real quick, the the point that I mentioned about the oceans, you know, about the the fundamental assumption being that the CO two is not in the atmosphere anymore anymore and that it's going into the oceans, that is an assumption of the Lashoff approach <laughs> and the Moracosta approach. These are both, you know, these scientific papers that have kind of made this point. It isn't necessarily an assumption of Carr and Vera's approaches because they just picked a number out of the air. They didn't have this, this rationale for, for, for deciding why we're going to come up with this number. You know, they, their rationale was basically we want to divide by 100. So it is kind of ironic that, you know, you can criticize the assumptions behind the Rotshop approach for, you know, not considering ocean decay, but you can't really criticize Carr and Vera even if under certain assumptions they're less conservative. The whole, the whole thing is a mess, but in general, uh, I support what Carr and Vera are doing. I think 1 to 100 isn't an unreasonable ratio. I wish that there was more scientific consensus around that number. You know, they're not really citing any literature, any papers, uh, but there is just a down-to-earth rationale behind it. Uh, and I do think that it's going to improve carbon credits uh, for everybody. Um, so that's my follow-up to uh, the Tanyir accounting video that I made. Uh, it's a murky world out there. <laughs>